<laughs> so, folks, greetings. I, I uh, you know, was delighted to welcome uh, the Children's Museum of West Hartford here for our family uh, STEM nights. Um, we did one back in February. We've got another one coming up at the end of the month, and we certainly do them. Look out for emails, announcements, news. Um, they're going to be here in, in April and May. We just, you know, we wanted, we wanted to have some fun this year. It's sort of a core part of what Gear Up um, is. Gear Up, gaining early uh, uh, um, experience and awareness and readiness for um, undergraduate programs. It's a college and career readiness program. It's really just about um, uh, sort of broadening our horizons and, and creating opportunities to, to sort of see what's out there, to deepen our engagement with, with STEM. Science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. Um, the program is uh, there's there's um, it, you know it promotes academic rigor. There's 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 tutors. There's um, leadership development and social emotional learning is so important to the program. There's after school uh, uh, clubs and opportunities that will sort of span all the way through um, from eighth grade all the way through high school, kind of and beyond. We'll have these summer enrichment. Um, there'll be uh, We'll work with you on college applications with financial aid counseling, all this stuff down the road. We'll do college visits, um, test prep. Uh, we'll go through the admissions process um, and, and throughout. We'll just be sort of creating these these fun enrichment opportunities. Um, next week starts a, a program called Career in STEM. There's a, an after school program that I hope you'll you'll um, you'll sort of join us for. Some of the folks on the call tonight who you know might be interested in STEM. This might be a really great thing for you. Um, Career and STEM will have uh, live lessons on Mondays, although they'll be recorded. And then one-on-one -on -one coaching as, as folks use this um, Career and STEM Explorer to see um, about different careers in STEM. And, and they have actually run kind of a gamut, huge spectrum of, of fields and, and things to do. And, and to explore some of that is to, to begin to think about some of the, you know, some of the opportunities that are out there, some of the classes that you might take that kind of bend toward um, you know, things that you might be interested in from engineering to um, there's just there's just so much out there and part of the, the goal of this grant project and part of gear up is just to uh, to expose you to some of these opportunities. So um, we're excited to be here with um, the, the, the Children's Museum and um, excited that you know, everyone here is on the call. And um, so here's to a, a lovely evening, um, much gratitude and I'll sort of hand it off to uh, Dan Butterworth of the, the Children's Museum and um, can't wait. Thank you so much, Dan. All right, sounds good. The one thing I don't remember if last time, did you have a thing that you did that you have focused on one speaker or did that happen on their end? I think it comes out in the recording. Um, I'm just thinking for the people it's... viewing it tonight, if they want to switch it over to a layout view where like, because looking at my head isn't all that interesting, but some of the demos, as we get more people logging in, the demos will start getting smaller and smaller. Like I was looking at the, in the little layout button there. If I hit focus, it brings up one person. Uh, It'll look better if we can find a way to sort of spotlight the person who's talking here. That happens uh, organically on the recording, um, but definitely, folks, your own viewing experience, you know, mouse over, hover over the top right corner of the screen, and you can adjust how you see things. That's and, where it was, right? And stage or even focus view will probably pivot to the people talking, and um, yeah, that'll be a better sort of more wide screen experience for you. Sounds good. Uh, and let's, I was thinking, I was thinking when you're introducing, it's like, wow, this is so, so serious. Some of these interesting, you know, goals and long term objectives. And here I am to like light things on fire and let animals run around on my desk. So hopefully we have some fun stuff going on here. Uh, I am going to start off with some electricity stuff. And it's interesting is that if you were here at the very beginning, I was talking about like, there's one demonstration I've done, which has managed to short out my computer once or twice. And then I'm going to do it first tonight, which I never do it first. So we'll cross our fingers and hopefully that works because I wanted to do some demonstrations with lightning. One of my all time favorite demonstrations is sort of a Ben Franklin demonstration dealing with lightning. But if I want to do a lightning demonstration, I needed to bring some lightning with me. And that's what this tool is here for. Uh, this thing is called the Tesla coil. Anybody know who that's named after? It's a Tesla coil named after. not the car company. It's not named after the car company. Oh, Tesla. Thank you, Aaron. I'm, I gotta, I gotta bring the chat screen up here so I can see it. There we go. Uh, oh, and Aaron's also telling us that it has dark mode. I should have figured that out. Um, I didn't find dark mode. Aaron found it before I did. Uh, so this thing's named after Tesla. 
Tesla did a ton of experiments with electricity. One of his experiments was this gizmo that he, he had this idea that he wanted to do wireless electricity. And it's funny because when I talk about this, like back in Tesla's day, they thought this was a crazy plan. But usually when I say wireless electricity to people now, they're like, that doesn't sound that crazy. I've got like wireless internet, wireless charging, wireless cable, wireless TV, wireless radios. We have all these things that run wirelessly. In Tesla's day, I joke sometimes, the only thing that Tesla owned that ran wirelessly was his horse. He didn't have any of these things. This is over 100 years ago he was working on this, but he came up with this gizmo that wirelessly gave off electricity. And then when I ask people if they think it works, sometimes I'm like, well, would we still be talking about him if it didn't? Uh, if you want me to prove that this thing works, this is where it's kind of funny. Because if I just turn it on, there's not really much to see. If I turn this light off, there's still really not that much to see. This, oh, my USB devices are jumping around online. That'll be interesting. But one of the things I brought with me tonight is one of these old light bulbs. And if you look at that, actually, let me dim this screen just a tiny bit. I'm going to make myself a little bit darker here. Oh, no, it did knock out my mouse for a second. Nope, I'm not going to adjust that at the moment. I think I'll be able to get that back. But if you see the Tesla coil coming closer to this light bulb, I think that's bright enough online that you can see that this is giving off electric. Now, if that's harder to see, I can bring up my Star Wars demo here. Just to prove that this thing is giving off some electricity. This one's a lot easier to see. It's just a different light bulb with a different gas inside. So, does that definitely prove that it's giving off some electric? You guys with me? Priscilla's giving me a nod. Thank you very much. See, that's always nice when I know people are like, yes, I can see this, and I know what's going on. I have one other different one has a different gas inside of it. I don't know. Do you guys want to see what this one does? It's different than the other one. I get one yes vote. Everybody else is like, my camera's off. It's very hard for me to answer that question. Oh, I've got some more in the chat. This one, over your camera, does it look more white or more purple? Because depending purple. on your screen, it might look a little different. I heard at least one person say it looks kind of purple on your end. True. Because the thing I've learned, I have a lot of different experiments. I'm going to turn this thing back off. Whew, that's loud. Uh, I have a lot of different experiments that kind of rely on the seeing a color of something, seeing a color of a chemical or a color of a light with different Chromebooks and different screens and different phones and different laptops. People see all sorts of strange colors. I see green, they see blue, I see purple, they see white. It just comes down to like how bright your screen is, if there's like sun shining on your screen. But those are just two different gases and two different bulbs and they give off two different colors. So you agree with me this thing will be okay for my lightning for the evening? Now, this is my favorite part because I have this little model building, which when I explain it, oh my goodness, my light bulbs are on top of the, uh, half of the invention. Here we go. I want to bring it as close as I can to the camera until I hit it with lightning. So this demo kind of goes back to this Ben Franklin guy. And Ben, when I bring him up and say, hey, has anybody ever heard of Ben Franklin? A lot of times people say they have. But then Ben was an interesting guy and he did a lot of different things. It does look like a lightsaber, Aaron. I agree. Yes, I just got that in the chat now. Yeah, go ahead. Wasn't Ben Franklin one of the founding fathers and he wrote the Declaration of Independence? Yeah, he was totally involved with politics and government back then. And this is what I was saying. It's interesting because when I bring him up, there's a lot of different things he's known for. One of them is all of his work with government and politics. One of them was working with electricity, which is kind of interesting because he was kind of an experiment. He did a lot of experiments there. Now, it's funny because they have kind of a famous painting of Ben Franklin. Has anybody ever seen this painting? Ben Franklin, he's out in a storm and he's doing something. He's in a storm and he's doing something out in the rain. I'm looking at the chat here now. No, oh man, I'm stumping you on this one. He's flying something in the storm. That's pretty much the last tint I can give if you've ever seen this thing. A kite? Thank you. Where'd that come from? Was that Ethan? No, Priscilla. Oh, he's... Oh, there you go. My mouse is back. 
you, that was the other thing. I was trying to wiggle the mouse to see the chat, and then just as I did that, you answered. Yeah, he was flying a kite out in a lightning storm. Does that actually sound like a terrible idea? Kite, lightning storm in your hand. If lightning hits that kite, you are in serious trouble. You know how you're supposed to like get out of a pool of lightning hits water? If you're holding a wet kite string and lightning hits that kite, you are in serious trouble. People have actually died flying kites near lightning and getting hit. It was a painting. Does that prove that he did the experiment exactly like that? Not really. And we know Ben was a pretty smart guy, so he probably did it a little different. Why on earth did he want to? That's kind of why I brought out the model house. Uh, back in his day and age, and if you were here last week, we put a lot of things on fire. And we said, if we want there to be fire, we needed fuel, we needed oxygen, and we needed something hot. Barns, were they made of wood? Pretty much, that's what your barn would have been made out of. Is there oxygen around your barn? There better be, or your farm animals are gonna have a seriously hard time breathing. So you've got a barn full of wood and oxygen. Is lightning hot? If lightning hits this thing, it was hot enough to light your barn on fire. Did you want your barn to catch on fire? Like if you called up 911, how long was it gonna take to get a fire truck out to your barn to put the fire out? Guesses? I'll take wild guesses on that one. Five ben? minutes, depending on the um, house you live in. Yeah, five minutes maybe, depending on the house. Ben Franklin calling up the uh, fire department. How long is it going to take to get there? Any, again, give me like one or two more guesses. I like Ben's guess in the chat. Too long. Aaron's got Aaron's on to me here. They hadn't even invented the telephone yet. Was there calling up any 911 back? This is like over 200 years ago. He said I didn't mention that. Ben was around a long time ago. Like you said, he helped write the Declaration of Independence. This was before the telephone. This was before the truck or the car. If you lived in town, maybe somebody would have started ringing a bell and some guys with like horses would have come by with barrels of water. But there, there was no 911 or fire trucks or any of that kind of stuff. If you lived out in a farm way outside of town, could you really call for help at all? Maybe you could put your windows down and scream, neighbors, bring the buckets. We got to get water from the river. Like, as bad as fires are now, was it worse then? It was even harder to get help back then. So lightning hits your barn, catches on fire. Ben did not like this idea. So he said, well, if we knew what the lightning was made out of, could we maybe figure out a way to protect the barn? Does it seem kind of reasonable? If you knew what the lightning was made out of, you could protect the barn from it? Yes. And you all probably know what lightning's made out of. I'm thinking that that's not a tricky question these days. But did they? Could they, like, go grab a piece of the lightning and figure out what it's part of or what it's made out of? No, because no. they didn't have technology back then. Yeah, like, and even now, like, could we go just catch a piece of lightning even now? I give your science teachers, like, all right, your homework tonight's go grab some lightning and bring it to school tomorrow. And this is not going to work. You can't do it. And when lightning hit the barn, it caught on fire. So would it actually make a lot of sense that the lightning was made out of fire? It makes sense. But could you prove it? Or could you prove that it wasn't made out of fire? That's what Ben was trying to do with these kites. Because he said, if we know what the lightning's made out of, then maybe we can protect the barn. So his idea was, he had these old fashioned batteries. Did you know they had batteries back in his day and age? They didn't hold very much electric though. Could he run his flashlight off of one of these batteries? No, because they hadn't invented the light bulb yet. Uh, and these didn't hold very much electricity. Like, have you ever reached out to a doorknob and gotten like a static shock from the doorknob? That's probably about how much electricity this would hold. So, you know, maybe he could like sneak up behind his friends and give them a surprise zap and then his batteries would be dead. The important thing is here, did he know this battery could hold electricity? That's what he knew. And he said, no, wait a second. What if I could find a way to charge this battery up with lightning? If that works, if I can get lightning to charge a battery, what did I just prove? What did I just prove if lightning is charging up my battery? If lightning's made of fire, am I going to be able to charge a battery with fire? No. You all have like fire powered battery chargers at home? It sounds cool, but I don't think it works terribly well. Trying to charge batteries with fire. So if the battery got charged, Aaron threw it into the chat there. The lightning must be mad at electricity. And this worked. 
The idea of how he probably did this and didn't electrocute himself, again, we weren't there and we don't have any photos because they hadn't invented the camera yet. But could he have flown a kite near a thunderstorm? He could have. Would it actually have made a lot more sense to like tie the kite onto a wooden post or something instead of holding it with your bare hands? I'd rather tie it onto a wooden post. And then he probably needed to keep his batteries dry. The idea was the batteries probably would have been under some sort of roof or shelter or something to keep them out of the rain. And then could he have tied something like a ribbon onto that kite string and brought the ribbon near his old batteries? That's the thing. That's the way they think this probably happened. And then if an electric charge got near that kite, that charge could have come down the kite string. But then it, as it got close to that dry ribbon, that dry ribbon would have brought that charge under, under the roof, near the batteries, and it worked. The lightning charged the batteries, and he said, ah, the lightning charges the batteries. The lightning must be electricity. He knew enough about electricity that he said, Electricity goes through some things better than others. You've probably learned this at some point or another in school, like conductors and insulators. Does that vaguely ring a bell? There's not going to be a test here, but the basic idea, like that rubber wire, when I grab it, the reason it's not electrocuting me is because can the electricity go through the rubber? That's the insulator. Inside the wire is the copper wire. If I like cut the rubber off of here and grab the copper wire bare, well, that would be the last demonstration for the evening because I would probably need serious medical attention. Electricity is really dangerous. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing with it, it can make you just a little bit dead. Um, these things are pretty safe to work with, but it's it was if you were here last week, I was talking about fire. You know, you don't do an experiment with fire if you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't experiment with electricity in your house if you're not sure what's going to happen. You know, people try to wire their own houses and end up electrocuting themselves because they don't know what they're doing or starting a fire. So, he said, what if we put a nice tall tower on top of your barn? Does lightning like hitting tall stuff? Do we know that? And even back in his day, they would say, like, look, there's a tall tree. What did the lightning hit? The tall tree. Look, hit the top of the barn. It wasn't hitting stuff down on the ground. It was hitting things that were nice and high up. This is why if you're ever out in a lightning storm, should you hide under a tree to get out of the rain? I've seen many adults do this, you know, bang, a flash, some thunder, all of a sudden it starts pouring down rain, all the adults run under the tree to keep dry. Could you think of a worse place to stand in a lightning storm? If lightning hits the tree, you might get hit. If lightning hits the tree, the tree might fall on you. You would be much safer just standing in the rain than standing under a tree in a lightning storm. But it happens all the time that people go under trees in lightning storms. Don't do that. But Ben said, all right, if we put something tall on the barn and we make it out of metal, when the electricity hits this tall thing, we know that electricity likes to go through metals. It likes to go through conductors. So just the post, that's actually not going to help. We need a wire. And if we hook a wire up to this lightning rod, well, now the lightning is going to hit the lightning rod. But instead of going into the barn, is it going to go down that conductor? And then we'll bury the other end of the wire in the ground. We'll take that lightning and make it kind of go around the barn and just make it go straight into the ground. Does that sound like a way to keep your barn safe? What do you think? What do you think the farmers said? These guys were, you know, they knew how to grow corn, they knew how to milk cows, and he comes up talking about electric and conductors and insulators. What do you think the farmers said? No. What are you talking about? You, it sounds like you're trying to hang a flagpole on my barn and charge me for it. Uh, how's that gonna protect my barn? That doesn't make any sense. Could he like pull out his YouTube video of his invention working somewhere? I think you guys are on to me now. There was no YouTube. There was no cell phones. There was no internet. Could he at least take them like to the movies and watch the invention? No light bulbs, no movie cameras, no film. That's why the painting of him was with the kite, was a painting. They could, we have no pictures, no photographs of Ben Franklin because they hadn't invented any of that stuff yet. Whew. That was the really long explanation of why he had to come up with a demonstration. To prove this thing worked, he built a little building and he put a lightning rod on it and he took a copper wire and he hooked it up to the lightning rod. He does it a tiny bit different than me because the way he did it actually makes a big cloud of black smoke when it's done. And I do this in schools sometimes and schools tend to frown upon making huge clouds of black smoke that set off the smoke detectors. So I do it a way that's a little bit, uh, a little bit cleaner than that. It doesn't give off as much smoke and stuff. How many people were here last week? I'm curious. 
You can put that in the chat if you just want to say, yeah, I was here. I know Aaron was. Was anybody else here last week that's here? I think it's a new group. It, well, here's the thing. If it's a totally new group other than Aaron, my guess is that Aaron wouldn't mind me showing off one little fire demonstration that actually explains how this works a little bit better. Aaron's like, yes, do the fire. All right, so if you're not going to complain that we do, because this is funny, because inside of this contraption, I want to put this bottle. But I'm not sure you're going to believe me how that bottle works. So I wanted to use the big bottle first. And now Aaron's like, oh, yeah, I remember how this works. So if I have a bottle, I told you a minute ago, if you want fire, you need three things, air, fuel, and heat. I've got my bottle. What's inside of the bottle? There's no water, by the way. If you think it is a water bottle, but there's no water inside of it. What's inside of that bottle? All right, Ethan, what's inside of my bottle? If you might have seen this somewhere before. Air, thank you. Is there oxygen in the air in this room? I hope so, or else this would have been a really short demonstration tonight. I'm going to grab a little bit of my fuel, which is not gasoline, by the way. I don't know why. I always feel like I need to point that out to people so they don't get the idea that they can like go to the gas station and buy a little bit of gasoline and try this demo. Don't do that. This is not gas. Is gasoline a great fuel? Yes, it is. It burns, but it is terrible for science demonstrations because it just explodes. So anything you put the gasoline inside of explodes and catches everything else on fire. So I don't use any gasoline for any science demo ever. I always feel like I want to point that out. And even though I'm not using gasoline, do you see what I always have handy if I'm messing around with fire? And I mean, I've never used one of these during a science demonstration. Knock on some wood there. Uh, but if I needed one, I would not want to have to like run downstairs to go get my fire extinguisher. All right, so I bought some fuel in there now. Sort of spun it around a little so it evaporated. I might actually put the tiniest bit more in. It all evaporated. If it's all evaporated, maybe I can sneak in a tiny bit more. Alexa wants to know what it is if it's not gasoline. Um, it's gonna, I'm trying to think if I answer this question. Have you ever heard of ethanol? It's more like alcohol than gasoline is the short answer. Like alcohols are, are flammable to some degree. Ethanol is a kind of alcohol, which is still can be dangerous if you don't do the right thing with it. But I don't use very much. And I've done this once or twice before. Ian will attest to this even. This is a silly safety thing I do. And I told this last time, I know. I used to light these by putting the fire right in like that. Which way does hot air go? Up. Would you want your hand right where my hand is? Probably not. Somewhere along the way, I realized they make these things that bend, and I always joke, like, I really have no idea who needs a bending grill lighter, except for me, because does that put my hand in a much better place? Now, so there's air in here, there's fuel in here, I'm about to put some heat in there. I'm going to turn the light off. I'm going to make sure I know what one thing is before I turn the light off. Mm -hmm. Ah, there it is. Just in case. Lights. This is a demo that, if you haven't figured out how to pin me yet, this is a good time to pin me so that you can see it as big as possible. And the other thing with this demo is don't blink because it's really hard to do twice. So don't say to me like a minute from now, oops, I went and got popcorn and I missed it. So I'm going to do like a quick three, two, one here. Three, two, one. Did it work? See, they haven't made any comments. Did they all pass out from surprise? Yes, it worked. It did. I don't see any eyebrows. <laughs> I, I would be the one losing my eyebrows, right? So, like, did you see fire shooting out of the top there? That's the important yeah. thing I wanted to see. Last week, I talked a lot about why it went out and how it ran out of oxygen. Because if you look in there, there's actually still more fuel. But since it didn't have any more oxygen in the bottle, it stopped burning. That's the combustion night. Tonight's electricity night. So... What we're going to do with the house now, I've got the little bottle and I'm going to put fuel inside. So I need my eyedropper for this one. I don't use quite as much fuel in this teeny tiny little bottle. And let's see, just, it's kind of a big eyedropper, I guess, but that's actually probably even more than I need. Notice I get the fuel away from all this other stuff. I'm going to do the same thing, spin it around a little bit, let the fuel evaporate. So now remember back at the beginning where we said we needed heat? So, like, if there was a spark, would that light 
something on fire too, maybe? Because when I put the cork in there, that's what people point out to me. They're like, well, uh, science guy, how, how do you plan on getting the fire back in the bottle when there's a cork in the top? Do you see the big metal screws? S metal screws are conductors. Will electricity go through metal screws? There's two of them because if that spark gets in there, it'll spark between those two screws. So we have fuel, oxygen, and a spark in the bottle. If the air in that bottle gets hot, what's going to happen here? The air in the bottle gets hot. What should the cork do? Let's see if they understand what on earth I'm trying to explain to them here. It's going to light on fire or the pop. Air, the air in the bottle will light on fire. Is it going to get hot like the big bottle did? Yes. When the fire starts shooting out of the top, what should happen here? It's going to pop. The what's going to pop? The cork. The cork. Yeah, I was wondering if you're thinking the whole bottle was going to like pop. That would actually be bad. I don't want to pop the bottle. But I do want to shoot, sort of shoot that cork out because that's all going inside the barn. Because this is how Ben proved that this invention actually worked. So now my fuel is in there. My cork is in there. I'm actually going to put one thing on here to slow it down just a little bit. When I do this in gymnasium, sometimes I hit the ceiling. The ceiling is a lot more nearby here, and I don't really want to keep knocking all the paint off my ceiling. So I want to slow this down just a tiny bit. I'm going to put the whole roof back together. And in a minute, I'm going to get the lightning, and we're going to hit the lightning rod with the lightning again. Here's the trick question. With it all hooked up, when I hit it with the lightning, if Ben Franklin's lightning rod works, what should happen? The rod is going to catch on fire. Well, the rod will, the electricity will hit the rod. What will the barn do when the electricity hits it? If the invention works. I wonder if they're stumped because they've realized nothing's going to happen. If the invention works, isn't it protecting the barn from the electricity? So that fuel and all that stuff, there shouldn't be any sparks inside the barn if the invention works. Should we try it? <laughs> so this is the one time I'm going to move this farther back now. The one time I shorted everything out that I was joking about, I did it right here, which is about 12 inches away from my camera. I think that might be too close. So, I am going to move us back to the other table back here that's made of wood. At one point, I was using a metal table back here, too, and I don't think that was a great idea either. So, we've got the lightning rod hooked up. The lightsabers are kind of in the way. I think they'd be flickering right where they are right now. So, let's try to move them. All right, I think we're all set. We've got the lightning rod hooked up, the cable. Just need the lightning. So I think I can leave the light on for this one. This isn't so much like a fire demo. It's just seeing what it does. So here we go. First time we're going to hit it. Three, two, one. Anything? Now give me just a quick thumbs up if the camera kept working that whole time. Okay, so somebody else saw that flicker too. You all were flickering on my end, but I could still hear people. This time, I'm not actually going to have to hit it for as long. Because think about this for just a second. Did that prove that his invention worked? What if I put water in the bottle? What if I was lying and I just put some water in the bottle? Would it ever explode if I put water in the bottle? Yes. Instead of fuel, if I used water instead. Would the water catch on fire? No, but if it has electricity. Yeah, but if I just hit that water with electricity, I don't think it would blow the cork off. It would be like I was cheating just to make it look like it worked. The only way to really prove that the invention works is by disconnecting it. So now it's not protecting the barn anymore. What if I hit it with lightning one more time? Should we do it? Because to me, this is what proves it actually works here. So now we got the lightning back. I'm leaning farther backwards this time, you'll notice. Three, two, one. Oh no. Let me check and make sure the bottle's close enough. What? You know what? When I moved it over to the other table, I should have double checked it. It moved a little bit too far away, which really kind of means the first trial shouldn't really count. 
Let me put it right where it belongs. Yeah, it shifted way too far. Because it's not going to jump like two inches inside the barn. All right, so should we hook it up one more time real quick just to prove that it doesn't work the other way too? That's kind of what I'm saying. If it doesn't explode at all, it doesn't prove anything. So let's try this both ways because I'm not trying to cheat. So here we go. With the invention hooked up, it shouldn't do anything if we're safe. Three, two, one. Nothing. Disconnecting the invention. It's not protecting the barn anymore. Now I'm going to lean back and I'm like 99% sure it's going to work this time if you're losing faith here. Three, two, one. It worked. <laughs> and just to show you, like, is that cork long gone? It actually shot over the computer somewhere. I'm not really sure. The roof is over here on top of my keyboard. Hopefully the cork is around here somewhere. The cork's the hardest one to find. Cool whip container. And that's how he proved that this lightning rod idea would work. He used calcium carbide. So he'd mix like water and calcium carbide together and it gives off a big cloud of acetylene gas inside. And then when you light it, it's a big mess. But it's the same idea. And he wouldn't have used the plastic bottle. He would use like a metal can to put it inside of. But with that basic demonstration, he convinced a lot of people to use lightning rods on buildings to protect them. Did you like that one? That's, I, I think it's a really interesting demonstration because it's got all sorts of different things. It's got fire, it's got sparks, it's got Ben Franklin, it's got a little history. I get to joke about how nobody could make cell phone calls back in Ben Franklin's day. Uh, and I did not, honestly didn't know how complex his experimental setup was to convince people. Of course, I had this image of him with flying a kite like a crazy person. And yet people have actually tried doing because they're like, oh, but... The idea is if the, does the kite doesn't actually get, have to get hit by lightning. The idea is if that kite was near a thunderstorm, it would still pick up an electrical charge. Uh, try to control that, though. Get your kite up near a lightning storm and make sure it doesn't get too close. To you. Don't do that. Do you still want to see an animal? Should I sneak out the critter? That's like a, I feel like the themes here, I don't really know how this animal connects to Benjamin Franklin at all. He probably never saw one of these animals his entire life. Uh, it would have been really weird if he did. Maybe that's the cool part about it. Uh, animals that Ben Franklin probably never saw. Let me get them out here. And we'll probably, you know, the one thing I didn't talk about in the very beginning is we're going to do that, the Ben Franklin electric stuff. Then we're going to do an animal. And then we're going to end on astronomy stuff again. So if we had people tuning in again just to talk about some astronomy, that's going to be the last thing we do for the night. So let me get my critter out. He was actually underneath the table, so I need to kind of reach under here to wake him up here. Wake up, dude. You're like asleep. I'm not even kidding. He's like falling asleep on me. Did he sneak onto the camera or was he still hidden? Every once in a while, people are telling me that like my camera captures a bigger field of view than I can see. Today, these kids were like, what's that box turtle shell doing there? And I'm like way over here in the corner there's a shell and i was like how could you even see that let me get this guy now he's awake finally all right pal let's get him up on the camera this is another time i like being the uh, spotlight speaker because then he'll look way bigger Whoop. and it's funny because the cameras like to focus on human faces way better than non-human faces so i have to like hide my own face so it doesn't try to look at me uh what is this thing what have i got He's like, what? What do you what do you wake me up for this time of day? Is it like a guana or something? An iguana is actually a great guess. Let me back him up a little bit because the one thing you can see if I show him a little bit farther away, he's a little bit smaller than an iguana would be, and he's about full grown. Iguanas can be like six feet long, so iguana would be a little bit bigger. But honestly, it would look a lot like this. Uh, I saw Jasmine in the chat said lizard. You are absolutely right. This is a kind of lizard because this is true. There's like five different answers you could give to the question. What is this? Lizard is definitely one of them. What else we got? Is it like a dragon lizard? It is a kind. They do. Dragon is part of his name. They don't just call him a dragon lizard, but dragon is part of his name. What else we got? Is it a bearded dragon? I don't it, know. What, I forgot what it's called. I'm not sure whose voice that was that time, but that's it. It was a bearded dragon. Uh which is a type of lizard, which the other thing you probably know this, like what giant group of animals do all the lizards belong to? If you're a lizard, you're also a... Is it an amphibian? 
You you got the right idea, but he's not an amphibian. He's one of the other big groups. Okay. That one I just didn't hear. Oh, I heard, now I heard it since I heard, saw yeah, I saw Ian nodding just as I was trying to figure out what you said. You said a reptile. Let me get him down at the camera level here now. Yeah, he's a reptile. He's a lizard. He's a bearded dragon. All of those are correct. Uh, amphibians, that'll be another night. I didn't bring any amphibians tonight. Uh-oh. I just realized what he can see. You know what? It's funny because I do turtle demos. I do lizard demos. I do snake demos. I swear this lizard is the only one who is starting to wise up to how this goes. Because I bring snacks for him to eat. And in a minute, if you guys want to see him eat something, I'll let him eat something. But do you see that look he's given me? That's his where's the food look. <laughs> he totally is ready to like get his snack. I can tell. I just have to be careful where my fingers go because he'll be like, is that the food? Uh, somebody explain to me why they call him a bearded dragon. Like what's he got going on that they give him that name? Because it's actually about one of his better adaptations. What's he, well, he's actually being very patient. He's not like trying to run to the food yet. Why do they call him a bearded dragon? Don't look at me, look at them. See, there's your fans right there. Yeah. If you waved at him, he could see that right now. He's looking right at you now. Is it because it looks like he has a beard? Yeah, I mean, do you kind of see this big lump of like kind of loose skin around his neck here? That skin, if he gets really, oh, he's like, was that finger my snack? Where's my snack? Uh, this loose skin under his neck, if he was really scared, he can kind of like puff it up and he gets it bigger. Sometimes it'll even turn kind of like a dark color, like black. So he'll puff it up, and if he's puffing it up, he probably has his mouth open, and he's probably showing off his teeth, so it looks something like, and his beard's all puffed up. Uh, does that actually make him more dangerous? That's just dust, pal. That's not food. Does that beard actually make him more dangerous? Ooh. No comments at all. So he hisses, he puffs up his beard. Yeah, a few people are saying, it's it's all for show. Like right now, he's just kind of sitting here nicely. And if I touch him, he seems pretty relaxed. If he was sitting here going, ah, would you really want to pick him up? And that's really his goal. If he looks like he's got a big mouth and he's hissing and he looks a little bit bigger than he really is, maybe some predator that's trying to eat him will leave him on. I'm trying to get the camera right down in his face here. I'm noticing a theme here. Last 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 time, you showed us a, a very colorful snake, but ah, was that the other one that was faking? Whoa! You see, that was him actually trying to bite the camera. He's like, ah, uh, is the camera my snack? You see, if you see his tongue coming out, that's him trying to eat something, whether it's my finger or the camera. Yeah, a lot of times these animals have these adaptations that are really all for show. The the snake I had out last time, ooh, there he goes. He's like, fingers, should I just give him the snack and get it over with? Because now he's going to be chasing my fingers around the table. Because my fingers look a lot like his favorite food. Uh, but his defense is basically look scarier than he really is. You know what my other comparison is that everybody seems to get? Have you ever seen a really scared cat? Now, assuming the cat doesn't like jump up and bite you in the nose, do they do that thing where they're like lifting all their fur up on their back? Why on earth is it, why are they doing that? All their fur goes up. What does that prove? What's it make them look like? Exactly, Aaron. It's making them look big. You know, they arch their back, their fur goes up. Maybe they're hissing at you too, but they look bigger than they really are. He puffs up his beard, he opens his mouth, he looks scarier than he really is. If I give him a snack here, and if you don't want to see him eat this little tiny snack, because here's the catch. He's an omnivore. Somebody tell me, what does that mean? He's an omnivore. He eats what plants? does he eat? He or eats is it about food? I heard plants or what did you say? Cool. I just didn't hear it that time. Might be my hearing though. Yeah, he eats both. He'll eat plants or like animals. Now, this little lizard, is he running around like chasing down white tailed deer and eating them? No. He's going to eat pretty small stuff, like these little worms, these mealworms I have, these are one of his favorite foods. The catch is, if I want him to eat, like, right now, on camera, while people are watching him, I have to give him something he really likes. If I give him a strawberry, 
He's going to look at it and be like, yeah, that's going to be there all night. I can eat that whenever I want to. If I give him a mealworm, is the mealworm going to start crawling away? And that's what's going to make him more interested in eating it here, if he ever spots it. You were just trying to nibble on my fingers. Look. Ah, there we go. Whoa! That was fast. Do you see what I mean about the tongue? You need to uh, turn on the slow-mo mode in WebEx there, right? This dragon's name is Smog, if you're interested in that sort of thing. If you've read your, uh, if you've read the right literature, you know where that uh, name comes from, that he's Smog. And the museum that I work at, the animals we have, they're all pretty much pets or that people couldn't keep anymore, or sometimes they're exotic animals that people shouldn't have had in the first place. Smog here is pretty much somebody's pet that they didn't want to keep. That's how we've ended up with him. And if you ever made it all the way out to our museum, like, yeah, we have all sorts of animals that have all sorts of stories about, you know, like turtles that people couldn't keep because they live so long, snakes that got too big, bobcats that really, really shouldn't live inside uh, a person's house at all. Uh, so what we do at the museum is we kind of, when we take an animal in, we keep them forever. So we sort of give them a permanent home, but then they have a job. And they have to come out and do programs and meet kids and you know we take care of them forever and that's the trade-off as they get to do programs this year it's meant that they've learned to go on zoom <laughs> and they get to be online i only have two more mealworms left here pal do you want them he's looking at me like he does do we have any questions about him because i do want to make sure ian's got some time to do some astronomy here too do you Greg? ever adopt the um animals say that again sorry do you ever personally adopt the animals uh not very often but it's happened a couple times I, I have my son you know he's gonna be 13 in a couple weeks so over the years we've taken in a few animals here and there that he's wanted to uh, also this year with the pandemic i actually brought some of the animals home out of the museum so that i could teach with them online at home versus trying to be online in the museum with all the various problems this year so like yeah right now i don't know if anybody here figured this out but this is my house this isn't the museum so yeah smog is hanging out at home with me tonight and um i because the only other thing i could think of that nobody really mentioned is like where he's from but i don't know can you figure that out just by looking at him i'll give you the little drone aerial view of what his skin looks like here too and i'll give you a hint that's what he looks like is a big hint of where he's from South Africa. South Africa is actually geographically pretty close. It would be harder to guess a place too much closer than where he's from, but he's not actually from Africa. Somewhere outside of Africa, but you're in the... Ah, let's see. I just saw it go by with like three different people. Tally, Aaron, said a desert. Uh, yes, and guessing which desert, that's kind of an annoying game. He's from the same desert you would find like kangaroos. Where would you find a kangaroo? Ooh. Where do kang kangaroos do live in a desert? What continent do kangaroos come from? Somebody knows this. I know you do. Kangaroos, koala bears, although the koala bears aren't from a desert, but same continent. Tasmanian devils. Ethan's like, I know it, I just can't. Turn your turn your mic on for 10 seconds and say it. Someone said Australia. Yes, it's Australia. Oh, there it is. It just popped up as you read that to me. They're from Australia. So if you were ever in the Australian desert, there could be bearded dragons out there trying to survive. The skin, does it totally make sense that they would blend into a desert? They've got that great cam. What's that word? You guys know that. They've got great cam. Mm -hmm. What was that? Cameo. Camouflage. Where they, you know, if he was sitting in the desert and you were like a, a hawk flying overhead, do you think there's a pretty good chance you just wouldn't even see him with those colors? I mean, here on a black tablecloth, it's pretty easy to see him. But imagine him sitting in like a sandbox. Would that just start blending in? Not to mention the fact that even if I saw him, I'm not really sure I would want to eat something with spikes on his face like that. Can you imagine trying to chew on that? Doesn't really look all that fun. So that's his one other kind of big adaptation is those wild spikes. All right, uh, I'm not going anywhere, but I think I want to hand things off to Ian so he can pull up some astronomy for us.
And I'm going to put smug away so she doesn't get herself into any trouble while we're doing some astronomy. Was there any like last second question about the critter here while he's uh, firing up the star lab? And I'm not going anywhere. You can always sneak a question in the chat too if you think of something you did want to ask. So I was curious think, about his uh, head. Is is that an ear hole? I was. It's funny. A lot of times people ask about that. They're like, "Oh my god, what happened to his head? Did somebody like bite a hole in his head?" And then I joke with people, especially little kids. I'll say like, "Well, do you guys have holes on the sides of your head?" And little kids are always like, "No." Then you're like, uh, check there. We do. Like, if you have an ear, there's a hole inside that ear to let sound in. The thing is, the lizards don't have the floppy part. Like, I think he would look fairly ridiculous with big floppy ears. But the hole, that's the exact job it's doing, is letting sound in. He can hear this whole thing. So, yep, that's their ears. That, oh, sometimes people think they're gills, too. But lizards and reptiles never have gills. That's a pretty hard, fast rule. You will not find, ooh, he's like, a rule? What's that rule? Uh, he's like, uh, you will never find reptiles that have gills. That's just not something that's out there. All right, I'm going to mute myself so Ian can take over. And if you found a way to spotlight me, you want to shift over to Mr. Robinson there. All right, well, I'm also going to need to be able to share. All right, I don't think I have that ability just. Please stand by. Now, I don't know particularly if it is supposed to be cloudy tonight. I think it was supposed to be relatively clear. So you should be able to actually see some of this stuff if you just go outside very soon. But I'm going to be sharing my screen because this is our, uh, basically the uh, way we um, present our planetarium shows at the museum is the same software. It's called Starry Night. Okay. And hide that. There we go. So you can see it's kind of like a round shape because it's supposed to be projecting on a dome above our heads. But right now we're just going to be on your whatever screen you are viewing at um, home. Now you can see I have a 416, so about an hour before sunset. Okay, so you see the sun just behind the trees over there, kind of in the direction of the west. Now, once again, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And I know, sadly, the real world out there doesn't usually have giant letters around the horizon to allow you to see what direction you're facing. So, once again, the sun always usually sets in the direction of the west. All right, sometimes a little south of west, sometimes a little north of west, but still in the general direction of west. And we're going to be focusing on some constellations. And I would like to um, show you some of those constellations in the south. So we're going to make it darker. We're going to set the sun. Now, tonight, you won't see a moon, all right? The moon is in what we call the getting towards the new moon phase. So it's actually hanging out during the day near the sun. So we will not be seeing the moon tonight. But you can see towards the west and southwest, we've got some of our wintertime constellations because they're more prominent during the winter, all right? We have this guy right here. His name is Orion the Hunter. All right, he's a pretty famous constellation. So we got his head, his shoulders, his belt, his sword, his knees. All right, he's got a shield out in front of him, and he's got a club raised above his head. To make that a little easier, they have some lines. We play the connect the dots, just as the ancient people did thousands of years ago to tell their stories. And once again, that's where most constellations came from, is people a long time ago, before we had books and all those things to write down stories, they would draw pictures with their imaginations in the stars to help them remember their stories. Basically, like I said, it was illustrations for their stories. Now, so here's Orion, and he was doing battle with Tauros the bull. So to find Tauros, you can use these stars in Orion's belt. And you kind of imagine a line between them going across, and it actually goes up and points towards 
this star called Aldebaran. And that is the bright eye of Tauros the Bull. And this V-shaped group of stars is called the Hyades. That's his head. So Hyades head with the star Aldebaran, his eye. We've got one horn coming up this way, another horn coming up this way. And he's got one of his front legs coming down this way. Okay. Now, the ancient Greeks would show pretty much only half of the bull, Tauros the bull, in the nighttime sky. But the scientists kind of cut him down even more because, once again, scientists don't like sharing stars when it comes to using constellations as a roadmap in space to help point out things. So, once again, they, they kind of trim down the stars used in these constellations so they don't get shared between constellations. And that relieve some of that confusion with other scientists across the world when they're trying to ask them to observe a similar space phenomena or object out there. So Taurus the bull looks not quite like a bull, he looks more like a big letter Y. Okay, so like I said, they've trimmed him down to just basically these stars here. Okay, now Ryan was a hunter and he was hunting with hunting dogs before he was called by villagers to help protect their village from Tauros the bull. And you can find one of his hunting dogs in the opposite direction along his belt. You remember this bright star called Sirius. That is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. Like I said, they've trimmed his stars down a little bit so it looks more like a lamp post or a little lamp, desk lamp. I don't know. It's tough to imagine some of these things sometimes, I understand, but we'll, we'll make it a little easier in a minute. I want to show you two more constellations quick. All these wintertime, main wintertime constellations hanging out here in the sky, kind of in the southwest around eight. So we have Sirius, the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. And we have, of course, if we have a big dog, we should have a little dog. So following the Orion's belt down to the Sirius, and you cut up to this bright star right here called Procyon. All right, this star is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Minor, the little dog, because, well, there's only two stars. So how they got a whole dog out of two stars, don't ask me, but there's the little dog. And then we have the Gemini twins up here. Okay, so we have Castor and Pollux. And the Gemini twins, and you can find them basically above Orion, okay, kind of above his club. And then how do I remember the names? Because Castor leads Pollux across the sky. And as I move time forward, you'll see that the stars once again travel from east to west as time moves forward. So I'm going to first time, now moving forward, you'll see that they kind of travel east to west. And so C comes before P in the alphabet. So that, is, that kind of helps me remember who's who in terms of the Gemini twins. Now, like I said, so now what we're going to do is I'll take all those lines away and make it easier to see by showing you some of the pictures and illustrations of these constellations that are out tonight. Okay, so this makes it a little easier to see. So we have Orion the hunter, Tauros the bull, Okay, Canis Major, the big dog, Canis Minor, the little dog, the Gemini twins up here. A lot easier to see. And of course, there's lots of other constellations out there, but they're just a lot, made of a lot dimmer stars. And if you're any near any light pollution or anything, which we pretty much every, anywhere in Connecticut, you're near a lot of light pollution, you, you won't be able to see these some of these other dimmer constellations like Monoceros the unicorn or Lepus the hare. Or I don't know. I think some of the some of the zodiac signs like Aries, the Ram, here are very difficult to discern or to understand in our skies here in Connecticut. And yes, I do say zodiac signs. They were formed from the stars, based off of where the sun would be at that particular time of year. So I'm going to put something up called the ecliptic. And this basically just shows you where the sun is 
at that time of year. Because as the Earth goes around the sun, it's facing a different direction to make it nighttime. Okay? Because when the sun's like over here, or sorry, say the sun's in the middle, and when the Earth is over here, well, it's facing that way to make it nighttime. But if the Earth is six months later on the other side of the sun, well, now if the Earth is facing this way, it's facing the sun and it's daytime. So once again, we have these kind of months highlighted here. Let me zoom in a little bit. So you may have heard of Tauros as a zodiacal sign. So technically, the sun is in this constellation, or when the Earth is facing this constellation during the day, okay, in the month of May and June, okay, that's kind of where all that comes from. All right. But of course, things are a little weird because I was born on July 5th. So July 5th is actually right here, okay, according to the ecliptic that we show. However, I'm supposed to be reading the horoscope for cancer. So wait, that's, that's like 20 days later. What's going on? Well, if you've ever played with any spinning toys, like a top, fidget spinner, just anything that spins, battle top, whatever, any toy that spins, you'll see that it doesn't stay perfectly straight. It, it, it wobbles and wiggles a little bit. Well, the Earth is a spinning object, so it wobbles too. But since it's so much bigger than your spinning toy tops, well, it wobbles slowly over thousands of years. And so now that has kind of changed the constellations that the sun appears in at, and the times that it appears in those constellations. So technically, things have been kind of thrown off. So from when that astrology, that system was initially invented by the ancient Greeks, well, things have moved a little bit. And so it no longer really aligns up the same way that they originally created it. And so Whenever you're looking at a horoscope or something like that, it's it's fun, it's entertaining, um, but you're a lot more than what that ever says, all right? You can be a lot more of a person than that. The horoscopes, like I said, are just so general anyway that you could, they're, most of them are right about everything because they're just so general that applies to just about everybody. So like I said, they're fun to look at and everything, but don't ever try to take it to heart that that really means you can't be friends with someone because of their sign, or you can't, you know, or that you must like something because of their sign, like, that. that's silly. So, but that is where it came from, is like this line, is this idea of wherever the sun was dawn on the day of your birth. And so, like I said, it's fun, it's interesting to talk about, it's an interesting part of history, but yeah, it does not actually determine anything about you as a person. <laughs> okay, so there's the zodiac signs. And of course, I'll just kind of go a quick little roundabout of the sky in the different directions so you can see some of those other constellations that are out tonight. There are 88 of them, but we see about 30 every night. Slowly setting, and of course we got the north, where we have some of our northern constellations. First the major, the big bear. First the minor, the little bear. And Draco the dragon, one of the more famous ones. He doesn't look like the bearded dragon whatsoever. He's a little bit longer. <laughs> and according to the stories told about him, a little bit bigger too. Now, did anyone have any questions or anything? I mean, I can't really see the chat, but someone could maybe relay something to me. Right now, there's nothing new in the chat, but if anybody wants to put something in there, I can make sure Ian hears what you're saying, because it's hard for him to see both things at the same time. Starlab kind of takes over his screen when he turns it on. Well, I, yeah, because I have all these controls that cover, covers my whole window, and I need to be able to see as much as possible because some of these stars are really tiny, so I want to be able to see as much as possible so I can know where I'm looking. About how far away are they? The stars? 
Yeah. Ah, some of them could be literally light years away. So it would take light, the fastest thing we know of in our entire universe, years, maybe even hundreds of years to get to these stars or get from these stars to our eyes. They're bright yeah. enough for us to be able to see them over that distance. Mm -hmm. Wow. One of the things that always amazes me with constellations is how they are like three dimensional. So like we're looking at it as like a two dimensional picture, but any two stars in the same constellation next to each other could be wildly far apart in that third dimension. It could be like far, much farther behind that other star. Well, actually I can show that off a little bit. Ooh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. All right. So I wasn't sure if we would want to take the time, but here we go. All right. This so is... I'm going to change things up a little bit. All right. So. I'm going to turn yeah, off some of these. It's the distance thing that blows my mind. While we head towards the sun. So we're going to actually go stop off at the sun here for a second. So while we go there, I'm going to turn a couple other things off and a couple other things on. That always amazes me that the sun is 93 million miles away. Yes, it takes the <laughs> sun. It takes light from the sun eight minutes to get to Earth. So we're looking at the sun as it looked eight minutes ago in its history. Because that's how far away it is. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the constellation on back to those lines because that's the easiest way to see this. So instead oh, of using no. those pictures and everything, I'm going to put down those lines again. All right, and I'm going to turn around so we can see some familiar constellations. Look, there's Orion and Tauros. And I'm going to adjust things a little bit. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to get away from the sun. We're going to get out of the solar system. All right, we're going to leave that solar system behind. And when we get further and further away, you'll see that the lines eventually start to get a little weird. For example, look look at the Club of Orion. You can see how these two stars are closer, and this star right here are closer to our solar system than the rest of the constellations. So you can see his, his um, shield and his club start to bend a little bit. All right, and you can take a look at all these constellations and start to see them bending a little bit as we get further from the sun. Right. Whoa. Because now we're starting to get beyond those stars in terms of distance. Right now we're 74 light years away from the sun. All right, and now we're gonna keep going. And now look, even as far away as those stars are, Look how close they really are to our sun in terms of our entire galaxy, the Milky Way. And that just gives you a sense of how extremely large, very, very, very big our universe is. And it's so cool that we get to be a part of it. I, I always find that so awesome. How special we are that we even get to see it, let alone just be a part of it. This giant universe. And this is just our galaxy alone. But once again, I just think that's a really cool perspective that you'll never ever get to experience in real life. But we can with knowing the universe as much as we do. And you can see all these stars making up those constellations are varying distances from the sun as we get back in there. Closer and closer. Looks like you've taken us to hyperspace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's a fun thing to do. I mean, it's it's something, like I said, it's no way you'll ever experience it in your lifetime. Mm. But here we can, because we can under, we understand how our universe is. Or we've understood this much about it so far. So there you go. That shows, that answers that question, I'm sure, to a different dimension. <laughs> that was awesome. All right, so... That's pretty much what we have time for. I don't want to use up everyone's all night. So. I was just going to ask if anybody had any last questions or if anybody had like a favorite thing that they wanted to share, like what they thought they liked best. You know, was there a certain demo, a certain thing? 
I'm always curious because we're coming back like three more times. I'm always interested to hear like which kinds of things that the people that are here like because my guess is you're more likely to come back next time. Um, I don't know what day next time is off the top of my head. Bent me. Yeah. I, I want to say it's the thirtieth. Let's see. I think there is another one this month. There, there is one on March 30th, actually. Now that you threw that date out there, it's right there. March 30th at 6.30. We will be back with different stuff. Different animals, different demos. Probably some different astronomy. Was there any favorite things? Your bearded dragon was a cutie. Smug, yeah, smug, smugs. Pe I don't. People really enjoy seeing him eat for whatever reason. Oh, Alexa, that's always nice to hear. Thank you. She said you liked it all. Mm -hmm. If you can't pick a favorite, I guess that's good too. 